This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs the Playbook, and very rare I get to say this, but I have an executive legend. I am so excited, huge fan. I get all kinds of Hall of Fame football players, baseball players, et cetera, but John Scully, Chairman and CMO of RX Advance, obviously the former CEO of Apple and Pepsi, two smaller brands, but what an honor to have you on the playbook, especially during this time. Thanks for coming, John. Thank you for asking me, David. Well, good. Well, you know, I want to get right into it because obviously we're in a compressed time of uncertainty. Uh, in running large companies, you know uncertainty, you know exponential change, things can happen and move on a dime. What are some of the key skills uh, that you've used over the years when we get into these high compressed times of anxiety? Well, I'd say two things. Uh, one is you have to have an insatiable curiosity. And a curiosity means that you're constantly scanning the landscape all the time, good times and bad times. And the second thing is that uh, preparation is what it's all about. You know, I remember having dinner with Kobe Bryant one night and he was telling me he does a thousand shots a day. And this was after he had retired from basketball. Uh, so people who become really exceptional in their fields are people who uh, are well prepared and they match that with an insatiable curiosity. And to that end, you know, we all have uh, different challenges, void shortages in our life, especially during these times. How do you keep a strong mindset uh, to not get distracted from your innovative creative side and also the pragmatic side, like you said, of taking inventory of what we need to do and, and how to practice that? One of the things I learned working with Steve Jobs was what Steve used to call zoom out, then zoom in. And by zoom out, he meant uh, look beyond the conventional boundaries of the industry that you're in and look at the things that may be happening that could converge with your sector, your industry, and then zoom in when you've identified that and simplify and focus on the details. So if you have that kind of construct, zoom out, zoom in, no matter what goes on around you, because there's always a lot of noise, you know, distractions, people have uh, urgent things that have to happen, you know, uh, near-term priorities shift, major things like the uh, coronavirus occur. So you have to be able to look at your zoom out, zoom in strategy, regardless of what's going on around you. And you've taken on, you know, not only the chairman role at RX Advance, but also the CMO position. And marketing is obviously one of these obsequious areas right now uh, where there's varying opinions on the communication that we should be having, not only internally, but externally uh, to our investors, our consumers, you know, our clients, our associates. Um, looking at the landscape today, how do you see the role as the CMO? What types of strategies are you guys executing in order to, to maximize the opportunities that exist while we're, we're in this uh, quarantine? Well, let me describe what RX Advance is because it's a relatively new company. Uh, we started a little over five years ago. It's already, uh, we'll do about $2 billion of gap revenue this year, uh, regardless of the COVID-19 pandemic that's going on. And we believe that we can eventually build this into a hundred billion dollar business over the next you know, four or five years. So we are a company that is in the $3.5 trillion healthcare industry. Uh, we focus on what is called uh, AI smart process automation, where we're going in and building a platform that covers some of the most foundational parts of the healthcare system but instead of a healthcare industry as it's constructed today, which is in vertical, often siloed type operations, we're horizontal, we're a platform, just as people are familiar with platforms and financial services, e-commerce, entertainment, telecommunications, it didn't really come yet to the healthcare industry. And so we're the first uh, really uh, large company that can scale to a, a much, much bigger company that is able to take the actionable intelligence that we capture from prescription drugs, uh, where we provide the role of what's called a pharmacy benefit manager, where we are in the role of working with the pharmaceutical companies, the large insurance companies, the large pharmacies, the large 
uh, provider systems in the healthcare. And in addition to what's called adjudicating the reimbursement, we take that actionable intelligence across the entire continuum of care. Remember, we're horizontal, we're not a vertical uh, of siloed uh, industry uh, construct. So therefore, uh, we are able to integrate with things like preventative care and wellness. We're able to focus on uh, the reversible chronic care diseases. 75% of diseases, chronic care diseases, are reversible like diabetes, like sleep apnea, uh, like obesity. And so if you can have that actionable intelligence and be able to get it into the hands eventually of the consumer, just like every other business that uses platforms eventually empowers the consumer, uh, it can mean that you can connect up uh, people tracking themselves on simple devices like uh, Apple and Fitbit watches and being able to take that behavior and connect it to the types of actionable intelligence we have across the clinical and medical system. And it offers uh, a, a very uh, transformative way to think about how do you zoom out and then simplify the healthcare system, particularly for preventative care and wellness. You know, it's so exciting to hear that I, uh, in my past before the sports world of Lee Steinberg and Warren Moon, I ran the first smartphone it was called the PCE phone, uh, pre-iPhone even. You may have remembered it from the 90s. But I talked about a ubiquitous world, uh, you know, and it was beyond the imagination of most people when I would tell them that in full duplex, you could talk for free in color to China. And, and is, you know, even in 99, when we had Comdex, people would look at me like, what is he talking about? Uh, and then there was great visionaries like yourself and Steve and others that saw far beyond it. I see the same thing in the healthcare system with your platform, but you saw it before there was a stress on the system that we have today. What are some of the techniques that you use? You know, because I think more than ever, there's huge opportunity. I call it the margins of the millionaires. Uh, when we have great change, more millionaires were made in the Great Depression than any other time back then. Here, once again, people that have the ability to imagine and then to effectuate I believe Steve told me this when I was young, connect the dots backwards, David. Uh, and I assume he was using a zoom in and zoom out approach. But how do you connect the dots backwards at this time saying, I have capabilities that may be synergistic or supplementary to something that doesn't exist today, but absolutely will exist as we come through or out of this? I think there are opportunities to zoom out and connect the dots uh, even greater today than any time that I've seen in, in certainly in my past activities. The reason for that is that we are in exponential time, not linear time. You know, when, when I was growing up, uh, people accepted linear time. We knew how long a day, a week, a month was. We knew what you could expect to do in several months, maybe a year. But today we work in linear time. And in mathematics, linear time means compounding math. It means that the uh, the, the future is measured in a curve that's going up at an accelerating rate of change as opposed to a straight line. And consequently, uh, things that uh, used to take uh, two years can now be done in two months. You know, we're seeing a factor of 10 improvement in some cases. And the reality is that it's very difficult for large, established, often very successful corporations who have been the leaders in an industry to be able to make that change as rapidly as entrepreneurs can. Because the only reason for an entrepreneur to exist is because they gotta be solving a problem that's not being solved already by someone else. And so they have to be curious. They have to be uh, able to put together a team that uh, shares in the vision. And everything they do has to be designed for eventually what's called speed to scale, the ability to scale it to uh, very large numbers. Well, fortunately, the technology today uh, is an incredible boost to us. It's like riding a wave you know, in a big surf. Uh, and you can either get crushed by the wave or you can get on top of the wave. <laughs> so um, it's, it's an amazing time. And I think that um, if I were a young person, uh, I would absolutely want to say, how do I you know, get a chance to get into you know, the entrepreneurial world? Because it's so different than the traditional corporate worlds. Yeah, and it's interesting how they blend, though. You know, both of us have had the experience, one of the blessings of my life is this, you know, 
change of executive uh, behavior for me as a young entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley and the internet, and then in the hardware side with PC phone, and then to run the most notable sports agency, and then into the media and you know all these areas of production that I never thought I would be involved in. Your career puts mine into a diminished capacity because you know, you went from, you know, the CBG, like the CPG products of Pepsi to Apple and now to healthcare. What are some of the skills, the knowledge and the perspective that you have as an entrepreneur and a super entrepreneur to be able to cross those industry lines, to be able to use your skills and knowledge, you know, from Pepsi to Apple to now RX Advance? I'd say that, that everything that I've learned that I put to use today, I learned after I graduated from university, meaning that uh, there is a lifelong experience. I mean, ironically, uh, in my era, back in Silicon Valley, it was all about microprocessors. You know, the first microprocessor commercial product was called a personal computer. And then we saw with Moore's Law, it, it kept doubling in performance about every 18 months to two years. Well, now the equivalent of that uh, rapid change might be the sensor. Well, sensors in healthcare are gonna be built into everything. Uh, we already see them in consumer products like Apple and Fitbit watches, but we're, we're gonna see ambient sensors that can be inside of a room of an elderly person who's living alone, who may be suffering from a chronic disease and being able to uh, measure uh, all kinds of things that are important to be monitored for their health. We're going to see uh, products like the first generation voice digital assistants like uh, Siri and like Alexa, uh, which are you request a, a answer, you get an answer back. Uh, the next generation is going to be conversational where you can actually have a conversation. And, and Google has demonstrated that with a uh, technology they call duplex, that, that it's very hard to tell, you know, are you having a conversation with an artificial intelligent bot? Or are you having a conversation you know, like you and me talking to each other? So this is a world that uh, entrepreneurs are gonna be able to take advantage of. You got all these resources out there and they're changing all the time. And so in, in my case, uh, I spend a lot of my time in biology, in chemistry, in physics. Uh, and you say, well, yeah, so what's your de degree in physics? I don't have one. You know, what's your degree in biology? I don't have one. Uh, so how can you talk intelligently and work with some of the smartest people in the industry on these things? And the answer is because I come to the table with what I do know, uh, which is my experience in working in high tech, uh, which is my experience with uh, design as an industrial designer, uh, my uh, knowledge over many years in uh, higher math, eventually leading to machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I say, okay, I can leverage those things I've learned somewhere else and then go on a steep learning curve. And it's amazing how much you can learn, you know, just going out on, on the web and doing your own searches on, on Google and then networking with people and, um, you know, hanging out with smart people. And, you know, that's the best education you could possibly have. And then you say, okay, now I want to get involved with someone who actually wants to build the companies. So I'm not running companies anymore myself, but I probably get 125 to 150 requests a week from people saying, hey, John, I'm doing something cool. Well, my wife is a data scientist and a, and a computer scientist. And so she kind of does the screening of things we ought to look at, but we only work with a very small number of uh, entrepreneurs. And we usually get involved not at the very beginning, but we get involved after they've been at it for a few years, developing the technology and putting the teams together. And they want to get to, how do I get to the next level? And so our role really comes in to sort of think about that. How do you scale the business? How do you bring in more capital? How do you, you know, reach the most important uh, customer opportunities? How do you find the right partners and all of those things? So um, thinking through you know, complex problems and hopefully finding a simple solution is where I spend my time. And speaking of spending time, one of the most common questions I get asked is about motivation and inspiration, especially now. People ask me, you know, how do you stay motivated and so inspired? And I do th see them as separate things. Uh, number one, I'd love to hear your perspective on, is there a difference between motivation and inspiration? And, and two, you know, 
a lot of people may look at you and say, well, why the heck isn't John just hanging out in Palm Springs with all the rest of those guys? You know, what keeps you inspired? Uh, it's because I'm sure you're just as productive as today as you were 10, 20 years ago. Well, it, it, it's kind of cool because uh, I just had my 81st birthday this, oh this week. Uh, I'm in super health. You know, I, I, I do Pilates every morning for an hour. Uh, normally my Pilates instructor is here with me, but uh, now we're doing it over FaceTime. Uh, my wife, Diane, does an hour uh, herself as well. I then go out for you know, a, a nice long run. Uh, the streets are all empty. I live here in Palm Beach. Uh, my house is on the ocean, so the beaches are quarantined yeah. at the moment, but I can sit up at my beach cabana. Uh, I have discovered that uh, I can actually do more things now during the self-isolation because I'm not jumping on airplanes, I'm not staying in hotels, I'm not going off to business meetings in person. So I'm, I'm one of those uh, 200 million people who use Zoom video. It's terrific. Yeah. And what makes Zoom video so successful? Because remember, we had Skype before that, we had WebEx. Uh, so why is it that Zoom came out of nowhere and it went from 10 million users in January to 200 million users currently in April? And I think the answer is, that it's much the way Apple think. You just keep it really, really simple. You make the experience one that is so you know, transparent to the, uh, that it bypasses the technology and it's just you and the other users who are talking together. And frankly, uh, when the coronavirus crisis is behind us and people say, well, let's get back to normalized life. Well, normalized life isn't gonna be the normalized life pre-coronavirus. Normalized life is gonna be how we want to live normally in what the next normal is going to be. And I think video conferencing, at least for me, is going to be uh, definitely a part of that experience. You know, it's so interesting because I run those parallels between Apple and Zoom because I was resistant to both at first, uh, you know, with my BlackBerry RIM pager and my IBM ThinkPad. I remember flying, which I fly 200 days a year like you do, looking over at someone with a, a Mac and he opened it up with no viruses and it went right to the screen. And I said, well, I wish I was an artist or a teacher. I could use that. And he showed me that it was a business tool. And I would say that I have sold more Apple products, never been paid or work for Apple, because it actually is simple and it has such extraordinary quantitative value that when chasm hits, when the awareness and the resistance is gone and people actually either are forced to be exposed to it or use it like Zoom, the real products stand out. The truth vibrates the, the fastest. And I think the same thing will be uh, true about RX Advance. And you've just, once again, got a shot in the arm because the healthcare system, the education system will both uh, change dramatically very soon. And, you know, I have three girls that, uh, and a little boy, but that are, you know, in higher education, virtually learning. And I think people like you and I will have an opportunity to not only have our children learn in a different capacity, but it allows us to be teachers again, that we can share, uh, in, you know, it's, it's one thing we tease the professors and I, I respect them greatly, but there is a difference between those who teach the world and those who run it. And I love seeing people like you having a platform like Zoom and, and, and this podcast even to help teach people an MBA in a day, uh, the amount of situational knowledge and experience. I know we're coming to the end. I always like to get, you know, especially with my legends, whether it's in sports, entertainment, or executives like yourself, what's the best lesson or piece of advice that you've gotten over the years that you'd like to share with people? Well, I think my best advice is that, uh, life is always about the people you meet along the journey because life is not a destination. It's really a journey. And uh, there's no reason why the journey has to, you know, be focused on the end. Of course, there's, you know, uh, an, an end to our life, you know, physically in, the, in this world. But uh, one of the reasons I got into uh, life science was I said, you know, uh, I feel as uh, active and, my mind is working as well as it did 25 years ago, but the reality is, you know, I'm old. And so what does that mean, old, in the context of what your life can be going forward? So I didn't have any interest to, you know, lie on the beach and retire. I've never retired, had no interest to retire. So I got into regenerative medicine and I started talking to people who uh, say, you know, the kids who were born today, uh, 
have a pretty good chance to live to probably 125. And the first person to live to 150 is probably already alive. Wow. And the reason for this is uh, that we're learning more and more that there are ways that people can have very you know, rich, sustainable uh, lives in their 80s and in their 90s. And so I said, wow, I'm not going to hang it up. <laughs> you know, I want to keep learning. I want to keep learning. So I get up every morning at five o'clock. And what do I do? You know, I read. I'm online learning stuff. Um, so keep your mind alive and exercise, just like an athlete has to exercise every day and practice, be prepared. The same thing with anything you want to do that you feel is important to you. And life is more about giving back than it is taking away. Uh, the real enjoyment in life is uh, what you can do for other people. And I think uh, all of us have an obligation to pass on lessons we've learned along the way to the next generation. So I, I agree with, with you, David. It's all about uh, you know, what we can do to help other people learn, to me, is much more interesting than uh, running the world. Yeah, happy, happiness is the most viral disease and we can spread it just by witnessing it and it strengthens our immune system and regenerates so much in our life. So uh, I am just so grateful that you joined us. Happy birthday. You do not look your age. Keep up the good work, both with the mind, the body and the soul. Uh, just your incredible information. Everyone, thank you. This is John Scully, the chairman and CMO of RX Advance, obviously the former CEO of Apple and Pepsi. I appreciate you joining me. This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.